So in this video, we're going to look at electron configurations and how they connect back to orbital diagrams like we've talked about in class. So we're going to clarify what we mean by orbital diagram, how they come from the, the relationships that we saw from Schrodinger equation and the quantum mechanical model, and how that led us to those quantum numbers of the n value, the shell number, the l value, uh, and what it tells us about the shape, and then the m sub l value, the 3D orientation of that orbital. And if we list all three of those, we know we have identified a specific orbital. We can have our orbital diagrams being shown by energy level, or we can have them just shown by shell level. What we have here is we have an energy diagram that shows our orbitals uh, being reflected by how they are in energy. So as we go up, that would be an increase in energy. The higher those orbitals are, the higher the energy they are. One thing we would note it is that all of our 4p orbitals have the same energy. So we can call those degenerate, which would mean that they have the same energy in them. Now this is helpful for us <clears throat> if we have these orbital diagrams that tell us, well, we have a 1s orbital in the lowest energy, then a 2s, then a 2p, then a 3s, then a 3p, then a 4s, then a 3d, etc. as we go up and up and up. Well, these energy, these orbitals can only hold two electrons, and each shell and subshell can only hold a certain number of electrons as well. And so what we want to do here is we want to apply a little bit what we've learned in class before, where we've had an orbital diagram, and we're being able to identify an orbital diagram for a specific uh, neutral atom that we would be that would be focused on here. So here we have a few different atoms, and we're going to try and apply this idea of identifying uh, where our electrons are as we reflect them in orbital diagram. Now one thing to know about our orbital diagrams is that they provide information about the number of electrons in each orbital. So we're going to show up arrows for up spin electrons, down arrows for down spin electrons, but it's going to tell us how many electrons we have in each orbital. And we're going to see we lose some of that information when we move on to electron configurations. And we can talk about why we might care of one versus the other. But let's go ahead and apply this with some of these neutral atoms. So here we have the nitrogen atom. We want to figure out how many electrons go into uh, each of these orbitals for our nitrogen atom. We have it conveniently set up here where we have our orbitals going from lowest energy to highest energy. We'll talk about how we can actually identify what the order of these orbitals are by using the greatest tool we have as chemists, which is the periodic table. And so here, let's go ahead and do that. We have uh, for our nitrogen atom, we've got to figure out how many electrons we have in a neutral atom. And so we know that it has seven electrons. Now, how do we know that? Because we know that it has atomic number of seven. So that means it has seven protons, seven electrons for a neutral atom. So I'm going to go ahead and fill up following the Aufbau principle, lowest energy to highest energy, following the Pauli exclusion principle, which says we can only have two electrons in each orbital, and as well possibly applying Hund's rule, which says if I have electrons occupying orbitals of the same energy, degenerate, they're going to do one electron in each orbital before going back and pairing up. And we're going to go ahead and show that in the process of how we identify the electrons we have here. So we got seven electrons. We'll start with our 1s. We put two electrons in the 1s, two electrons in the 2s, and so now we have four electrons. I got three more. And applying Hund's rule, as I go ahead and I put them one electron in each orbital before going back and pairing them up. So if I didn't follow Hund's rule and I just kind of simply paired them up in this way, what we would notice is that this would actually exist as a slightly higher energy because we have the repulsions between those two electrons there. So that's where Hund's rule comes into play. We're trying to get to the lowest possible energy for these seven electrons. So we only put one in each of those different 2p orbitals. So now we have our seven electrons there. They're occupying the 1s, the 2s, and three different 2p orbitals. Now we go ahead and let's go ahead and do this for the uh, sulfur atom. We go to, to the sulfur atom. We find that it has 16 electrons. Again, atomic number 16. I go to my trusty tool on the, the wall behind me here, my periodic table, and that would tell me what my atomic number is, which is also the same as the number of electrons. Again, we're dealing with neutral atoms here. Okay, when we start getting to ions, then we have to think about are we adding electrons or removing electrons to make those ions. So now again, we got our two electrons in the 1s and the 2s. 
we go ahead and get three in each of one in each of the 2p. And so now we have a total of 10 electrons. We still need six more. Two more, we got 12. So I'm going to put one in each. And then now I have one in each that gives me 15 electrons. And I can choose any one of these. Maybe I just uh, choose the left one just because I like going left to right. Uh, and now I have the place where I have one set of electrons that are paired up in the 3p. And then the other 3p electrons are now um, singly uh, occupying those orbitals, only one electron in each. So now once you go ahead and do this uh, on your own, pause the video and write out the orbital diagram for an iron atom that's neutral and a selenium atom that's neutral. So hopefully we've had a chance to write out these orbital diagrams for these neutral atoms. So again, we have our iron atom, which has 26 electrons as a neutral atom, it's atomic number 26. Selenium it has 34 electrons as a neutral atom, it's atomic number 34. We go ahead and we fill those up uh, and we notice that in this case we have a lot of unpaired electrons in the 3D uh, that we see for iron and we have a couple unpaired electrons again following Hund's rule where we fill up one uh, before we go back and we pair them up. We put one in each of those equal energies. Now what we notice is that this gives us a lot of information about where our electrons are in specific orbitals. But sometimes we don't necessarily need to know how many electrons are in each orbital. Sometimes it's a little bit more helpful to shorthand this and provide the information into how many electrons are in a subshell. So how many electrons are in a 3p subshell or the 3s subshell or the 4p subshell uh, for a neutral atom. And that's where our electron configurations come into play. So our electron configurations, what they do is they tell us how many electrons are in each subshell. So I'm not going to have boxes for my orbital diagram like we saw for, excuse me, for the orbital diagram because I just want to know how many electrons are in each subshell. And the way that we're going to write this is that for a subshell we're going to put the n value followed by the uh, l value in whatever letter form we would have it. Right, to remind us when we're thinking about this, if L is 0, that is S, L is 1, P, L is 2, D, L is 3, F, L is 4, G, etc. Okay. So we're going to do that by saying if I have, for example, an N equals 2, L equals 0, that would mean I have a 2S subshell. Okay, and N followed by whatever the shorthand is and the letter for that. So now we have the ability to write that out. Now what we're going to do is we're going to express how many electrons we have in each of those subshells with a superscript with that number. So let's go ahead and clarify what we mean by that here. So for example, we already wrote this out with regards to the nitrogen atom. So I, if we already know that we have the nitrogen atom here in the 1s, we have two electrons. So we put 1s superscript 2 to say that they, there are two electrons in that 1s. Then we would have the 2s, and we notice there's two electrons in the 2s, so we put 2s2, and now we have three electrons here, and we would have 2p3. Now notice what we do is we lose some of the information provided about how many electrons we have in each orbital, but we're going to see it may be more important for us when we're looking at kind of larger reactivity that we care about how many electrons are in each subshell, because it may tell us something about bonding, may tell us something about uh, ion charges, etc. So that would be our nitrogen atom. And <clears throat> then we also can look at our sulfur atom. Our sulfur atom would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p, and it looks like we got its full, 6. Then we would have 3, 3s2, and then we have 4 electrons in the 3p, 3p4. So that would be our electron configuration for the sulfur atom that we'd have here. Now we also follow this up with the number of valence electrons for these atoms. Now we go ahead and quickly define what we mean by valence electrons. Those are the electrons with the highest n value shell. So they're within the highest n value shell and they are furthest from the nucleus, because remember we define the n values telling us how large that shell, shell, orbital is going to be. The larger the n value, the larger 
uh, the orbital size. And so then because of that, those are furthest away. Those are going to be, well, importantly here, those are going to be mostly involved in our reactions because those are the electrons that are available and outside. So we, a lot of times we, wanna, we care about what those are because they tell us something about the reactivity of an atom. And so here we go ahead and we look at our nitrogen atom. We have n equals 2 as our largest n value, and we have a total of 5 electrons in the n value. So that means we have 5 valence electrons. There's 5 that are in that furthest n value uh, for our specific atom that we have there, nitrogen. Then we go to our sulfur atom, and we notice that n equals 2 is not the highest n value that we have. Here we have n equals 3. So these electrons, our six electrons there, are our valence electrons. And that would be the valence electrons in the 3s and 3p. We'll see that the valence electrons are going to depend on the specific atom that we have here. So once you go ahead and take the information that we've talked about so far, and on your own, once you go ahead and write out the electron configuration, for a neutral atom of iron and selenium, and as well do what we just did, identify the number of valence electrons for these atoms. So hopefully we've had a chance to write out our electron configuration, and maybe look something like this that we would see for iron and selenium. Uh, we have our electrons, all of the val all the shells and subshells are full until we get to our valence shell, uh, and we, we see that we have these partially filled uh, shells that we would have. Now let's go back and let's identify our valence electrons. Reminding ourselves that our valence electrons, importantly there, are our highest n value electrons. These aren't necessarily the last electrons we put into our uh, orbital diagram or the last electrons we add in when we're writing out our electron configurations. Uh, these are not necessarily the highest energy electrons. These are the ones that are furthest from the nucleus. So if we go here and we see our n value here for uh, the iron would be 4s. 3d is the n equals 3. Even though the 3d is a little bit higher energy, they're closer to the nucleus than the 4s because when we're looking at our size, is dictated by the n value. And so we see here we have two valence electrons. Those are in the 4s orbitals in our 4s subshell. And again, we note here this 3d is not are they are not valence electrons. Remember, these are the ones that are furthest from the nucleus, highest n value, those are our valence electrons. Selenium, here we have 4s and 4p. So we notice that our valence electrons, again, not the last electrons that we add in. Uh, they are all the electrons that are furthest from the nucleus, highest n value. So we would have a total of six valence electrons in the 4s and 4p. So we see that we have the ability to identify electron configurations, orbital diagrams, and this is going to be really helpful for us as we start thinking about reactivity, ion charges, bonding, all those different things. We must have these as foundation before we can actually move forward with that. Now what we notice here is that I had available for us these orbital diagrams, and we use those maybe to write out our electron configurations, or maybe we used it to write out uh, our, orbit, our excuse me, uh, the orbital diagrams that we drew out. Okay, but what if we don't have those? Do we have to draw them every time? Do we have to memorize those? Uh, and what, what the, the most amazing thing is one of the reasons why I love um, chemistry is it makes so much sense and it fits so well together when we think about reactivity and periodic patterns, which is why we have a periodic table. And what we'll notice is that our s orbitals, our p orbitals, our d orbitals have a certain number of electrons they, that can occupy them. Right? So for example, what we'll see here if I look at this grouping here, we'll see there's two electrons, uh, two columns there. We're going to call that our S block because as we are adding electrons, we're going to add electrons into the S subshell, right? So here we have, this would be like adding 2S, 3S, 4S, 5S, 6S electrons if we're filling them in. We also see here we have Ten columns, and that would be ten d electrons, and so we call this the d block. So again, now as we're filling in these electrons, we're filling in our electrons in the d subshells. Now, one thing we notice is that when we're filling in these electrons in the d subshell, 
we add we fill electrons into the 3d after the 4s so we'll notice this is going to be in our n minus 1 or what we would call here as our period number right 4 minus 1 we fill in the 3d there then we go over here and we notice we have six electrons and so that would be for our p subshell and so we call this the p block right and we also can go over here and we notice that we have 14 electrons and this would be the f block so instead of trying to memorize oh does 3d come after 4s or 4p how does the order go does it come after 3p we can just simply track what we would follow on the periodic table here so let's say for example i wanted to write out the electron configuration of something like um let's do let's do something long here so let's say 10. okay so that means what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with helium and I'm going to fill in all the way across until I get to 10. So I'm going to go across and I'm going to fill it in that order. So from hydrogen and helium, that's 1s, and we've got two electrons. Then we have lithium and beryllium that's our 2s2 electrons then we have boron to nitrogen that's our 2p6 then now we have we're going to n here now these are all our n values is our period number now we have 3s2 then we have 3p6 and again telling us how many electrons we have it tells us based upon the columns then we have 4s2 and we remind ourselves that this is the n minus 1 our d is one less than the period number so that's where we go back down to 3d we got 10 electrons there then we go here, where now we have from gallium to krypton, we have another six electrons, so that'd be 4p6. Then we have our rubidium and strontium would be 5s2. Yttrium all the way to cadmium, again, n minus one, which would be 4d10. And then we go to tin, and we have 5p, and we got two electrons there. So we see here, we don't actually have to try and memorize what these orders are. We can use the periodic table, our greatest tool as chemists, to track that and follow where our electrons are occupying. And this is going to be helpful for us as we're identifying electron configurations, looking at bonding, looking at ion charges. We're going to use the periodic table quite frequently from now on as a resource for us there. So hopefully after this video, we feel comfortable writing electron configurations, how that connects back to orbital diagrams, as well as how it is all wrapped into what we see here in the periodic table. So I look forward to seeing you in class. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion on the application of our electron configurations and utilizing the periodic table.